Well, good morning, everybody. Now, we're going through a part of the book of James in a series entitled Authentic Christianity. There is a fake Christianity out there that makes God sick. But there is an authentic Christianity that warms the heart of our God. And James is reminding us the components of that authentic Christianity. And this morning we're going to talk about making right decisions. And James is going to help us to understand what that is about. So take a look with me, James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. No, this is earthly, natural, and demonic. James says there's two kinds of wisdom. There is a wisdom that comes down from heaven above, but there is another wisdom that originates in the pit of hell itself. And James is asking us the question, what will be the wisdom that drives your decisions? Which one will it be? And he helps us to understand the first one. There is a wisdom that is driven by obedience to the principles of God. Listen to how he puts it. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Now, this good behavior he's talking about simply means the principles of God's Word. So what are those principles? Well, you can begin with the Ten Commandments. You can go from there of all the things that God has taught us. Jesus, though, brings all of it together. He brings everything that that God has taught us about the principles of God into two key ideas in Matthew chapter 22 and beginning in verse 37. And listen to what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and foremost command. And the second one is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two commands hang all the law and all the prophets. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying to us, listen, you just got to remember two key ideas because everything that God has taught us all come together in these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is authentic Christianity. God never taught us to to be mean to other people. Jesus never said to us to push other people away. What he said to us is that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's authentic Christianity. So when loving God and loving others becomes the driving force of your life, you will be a wise person. You can't help but make good decisions. Because the decisions you're making is coming from the teachings of God's Word. But James also reminds us there's another kind of wisdom. It comes from the very pit of hell itself. And notice how he describes it. There is a wisdom that is driven by an impure motivation. See verse 14 and 15? But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. There is a street wisdom, a a, a street knowledge in doing business and a street wisdom of living life. But it always ends up costing you far more than you get when you live by it. I've had people in my ministry from time to time that said to me, you know, pastor, these, these are really great truths, but the truth is you can't do business the way the Bible talks about it. You, you can't live life the way the Bible talks about it. Well, I'm here to tell you, I know many businessmen who do exactly what God's word says, and they run their business. It's according to the truths of God's word, and God blesses them, and they live their lives by what God teaches them to do, and God blesses them. Maybe you won't make as much money if you do it God's way, or maybe you'll make more. But here's what I will know. What will happen in your life is that your life will be blessed by Him and honored by Him, and the relationships of your life will be so much stronger. Yeah, yeah, there is a street smart 
but it will not get you where you think it will. And James explains it. He says there are two driving influences of worldly wisdom. And the first is jealousy slash envy. Now, I include both of these simply because there are some translations that use the word jealousy of that Greek word, use the word jealousy like the one that we read, but there are other translations that translate it envy. The truth is both of these words have the same root idea, but they're a little different. Jealousy is your hands full. You already have it. And now you're afraid somebody's going to come and take it away from you. There's a story in the Jewish Bible that we Christians call the Old Testament. There is a story in the Jewish Bible about this very thing of a man whose name is King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. And Saul was a pretty good guy, and he liked God well enough. But the longer he went in his kingdom, the further he got away from God. And one day God said to him, I'm going to take your kingdom from you. Well, now he's on the lookout. Who's going to take this kingdom from me? And he sees David, such a man of God, and the people's hearts are turned toward David, and he becomes jealous. He's already got the kingdom. He's afraid somebody will steal it from him. And he becomes jealous of David and he starts hunting him down, trying to kill him, but God wouldn't let him be successful. Jealousy is hands full, thinking somebody will steal it from you. But envy is coming with hands empty and looking and seeing somebody already has something that you want and you try to figure out a way to get it from them. There was an illustration in the Jewish Bible of this too, a man named Absalom. King Saul finally died. He died in battle. And David became king. And David was a godly man. David was a man after God's own heart. And God so blessed him, the greatest king in all of Israel's history. And David had sons and daughters. And one of those sons was a young man named Absalom. And Absalom became embittered against his father, and Absalom wanted to be the king, and so he worked the system, and he got the hearts of the people directed toward him, and then he raised up his hand against his father David. But God would not allow him to be successful. Neither jealousy nor envy ever brings honor to God. It only destroys relationships, and it only distances God from our heart. So I'm asking you the question, what decisions are you making on the basis of jealousy, on the basis of envy? How many things do you buy because somebody else bought them, and somehow you got to be like them? Sometimes, somehow you got to have as much as they have, and so you go out and get it. You don't really need it. It's probably not the right thing to do, but you buy it anyway. How many decisions have we made like that? How many hours do we keep putting in? More and more hours trying to get more and more money because the more money we have, the closer we become like those people that are our neighbors. But all the while, damaging the relationships of our family and moving further and further away from God. The driving influence of decision-making that the Bible calls evil is jealousy and envy. But there's a second one. The second is selfish ambition. Selfish ambition has as its heart a me-centered philosophy. Well, if you get in my way, I'm going to run right over you. I don't care what happens to you. It's all about me. I'm going to run over you. I'm going to get what I want no matter what I've got to do. I will do whatever it takes to do for me to feel successful. It's the me-centered philosophy. And how many people get destroyed in the wake of it all? How many relationships are damaged because of that? The person who is dominated with the desire of pushing themselves to the top are the ones who have that selfish ambition that James is talking about. Listen, God is able to elevate your life. God is able to open doors and close doors and every door, whether he opens it or closes it, is a blessing from him. 
And God says, why don't you just do this? Why don't you trust me? Why don't you work hard? Why don't you do your very best? And let me open what doors I want to open and close what doors I want to close. And why don't you trust me? And all the while, I'll be blessing the relationships of your life. When copying the world's standards of success characterizes our life, the results will always be broken and ruin relationships. And that's what James is saying in James chapter 3 and now verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And James is saying this is the wisdom from hell itself. But you and I can live in a different way. The last two verses of this passage of Scripture really help us to understand sort of the nuts and bolts of how it is that we live in a, in a godly kind of wisdom. So notice what James says in verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James is saying, look, if you'll be willing to do what I'm teaching you to do, God will actually be improving the relationships of your life. They will keep growing and maturing all the while he's blessing you. You can literally have it all, but only with the wisdom of God. So what does he teach us? What are the things he is showing us? Well, first of all, he says that if we are wise, we will not make choices that compromises our integrity. Verse, 13, verse 17, but this wisdom from above is first pure. The word pure actually means uncorrupted, authentic, with integrity. What he's saying to us is don't live a lie. Live the truth. Even if you messed up, own it. Acknowledge it. Be truthful about your situation. Even if it's embarrassing, be truthful about your life. All solid relationships are built on trust and respect. And even if you mess up, people will still respect you if you're willing to be honest about it. Dr. Leonard Keeler is the man who created the lie detector uh, machine, and he personally tested over 25,000 people. I don't know how in the world he did 25,000 people. But when he got finished with all of that, and, and he wrote up what it is he'd experienced, he said this sort of bottom line. He said, basically, most people are liars. Well, we probably could have told him that before the 25,000 tests, but don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. So you don't have to remember what you said if you just say the truth. And the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. The man of integrity walks securely. The woman of integrity walks securely. Wisdom that comes from above is honest. Second of all, if we are wise, we will not antagonize another's anger. Wise people work at maintaining harmony. They're not always looking for a fight. Now look, there are times of conflict and they're not avoidable. There are some things that there needs to be a conflict about. There are some hills that are worth dying on. Not every hill, not most hills, but every so often there is a hill that you got to take. And sometimes there is conflict and you cannot avoid it. But that should not be the way we live. There's some people that just can't wait for the next fight, the next battle, and they're creating a hill to die for for every hill. And they're the most difficult people in the world to live with. I, I had a guy early in my ministry one day who said to me, I'd been into that, at that church for several years, he said, you know what? We haven't had a fight since you got here. And I'm just itching for a real good fight. I couldn't believe he admitted that to me. But I thought, that's pretty sad. Seriously, you're itching for a fight? 
James chapter 3 verse 17 says, wisdom is peace loving. I heard about a guy who was so argumentative that he would only eat food that disagreed with him. Okay, I know that is so corny, but I read it and I thought, I got to figure out a way to work that in somehow in this message. William James says this, the secret of wisdom is knowing what to overlook. Some things are just not worth the fight. Have the wisdom to discern what is. What is the battle that you've got to do? What's the hill worth dying on? But don't make it every hill. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3 says this, Any fool can start arguments. The wise thing to do is to stay out of them. And then there's the third thing that James teaches us. If we are wise, we won't minimize each other's feelings. James 3.17, wisdom is considerate. It's also the word gentle. The word considerate means mindful of others' people's feelings. You're not going to be surprised by this, but the two top presidents in American history in my book is George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. I just look back with such respect of those two guys. They weren't perfect men, but, but they were fantastic presidents, and I, I really admire them. And I don't always know which one I admire the most. It sort of fluctuates back and forth. Abraham Lincoln was an incredible man, an amazingly powerful, strong individual. He got us through the Civil War. I have the greatest respect for him, and he was known as a gentle man. Not all the time. He could have a, a temper, but he was also known as a man who considered other people's feelings. He invited a guy to come to the White House. He was sort of a backwoodsman type guy, maybe in the backwoods of Pennsylvania or someplace. And he had done something really wonderful. And, and uh, President Lincoln wanted to give him a special notation. And so he asked him to come to Washington. The man did. He, he asked him to come to the White House. He visited the president. And there was a dinner that he was invited to come to. Now, it wasn't just a dinner between him and the president. There were a lot of people there, senators and their spouses. They were all around the table. It was a big table, and, and it was full. And this man, this backwoodsman, was there. But he didn't have all the social graces that the others had. When the coffee was served, this backwoods guy poured some of that coffee into the saucer and blew on it and then drank the coffee out of the saucer. Other people looked at him and, I mean, everyone just stopped dead in their place and watched this guy, could hardly believe it. And even the president was a little surprised. And then there was some snickering and some laughing. And so the president made a statement so everybody would turn attention back to him. And then he took his cup of coffee and he poured a little bit of coffee in his saucer and blew on it and drank the coffee out of the saucer. Well, the president has done this now. So everybody around the table starts pouring their coffee into the saucer and they all drank their coffee that way. Because this man, this great president considered the feelings of others. Number four, if he says, if we're wise, we will be teachable. James 3.17, wisdom is reasonable. It means a person who is open to reason. It means a person who is teachable that hears other people out. Not every idea that we hear is an idea that we ought to accept. Most of them aren't. But at least maybe we can listen. To be teachable means to be willing to listen, willing to be open to ideas and suggestions. Uh, the RSV version says it this way, it is open to reason. The Living Bible says it allows discussion. Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, a fool thinks he needs no advice, but a wise man listens to others. So how wise are you? Here is the fifth thing. If you're wise, you will forgive each other's failure. Wisdom is full of mercy, he says, and good fruit. Have you ever forgiven and then forgotten? Did you ever forgive and then forget? Or 
Did you just hold on to it a little while and then bring it up a little bit later on? There were two women that were walking down street, down, down Main Street, and they were uh, walking on the sidewalk, and they looked across the street, and they saw another man who was coming the other direction, and one of the women turned to the other woman and said, hey, there's that guy. There's that guy that treated you so badly. Here's that guy that was so mean to you. He's right there. And the woman turned to the woman who pointed out the guy, and she said, you know what? I clearly remember forgetting about what happened. Is that what you do? You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, verse 9, love forgets mistakes. Love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts even the best of friends. Being historical, not hysterical, being historical can damage even the best of relationships. Part of the whole idea of wisdom from above is that we make a decision that I let it go. Don't hold on to it till later. I let it go. And I forgive. And here's the last one. If we're wise, we will be real in our relationships. James chapter 3, verse 17. Wisdom is impartial and sincere. Sincere, authentic, real. The greatest thing that can ever happen to the relationships of your and my life is that we're just us. We're just us. One of the great things that that I have noticed about life as I've walked through it these years is that one of the great things that you learn is about who you are. Coming to understand you and accepting how God made you, how God wove you together. Just coming to the place to accept yourself. There's always going to be somebody more talented, always going to be somebody better looking, always somebody that is smarter. There's always going to be people like that. But coming to accept how God made you to look, just how beautiful and handsome you really are, and how talented you are. And you're still learning new talents all the time that God gave to you, all your life, and how smart you are. Instead of comparing yourself to other people, accepting yourself for who you are, who God made you to be. He didn't make any mistakes. He made you. It's one of the greatest parts of building deep relationships, just being you, being sincere, being authentic. So here's the question. How good are the relationships in your life? How are, you, how are you doing with your relationships? How deep are they? How, the, how much are they building? I'm going to tell you one day when you and I finally get to the end of our lives, we won't look back and think about the big business that we built and how much money we made and what was in our checking account. What will really matter in that moment are the relationships of our life and the time and energy we put into them. So why don't you do what God says is heavenly wisdom? Learn how to love your neighbor as yourself. Learn how to build deep relationships. And don't cash them in for money and for other things. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we come to you and we say, Lord, we love you. And we're so thankful for the privilege you've given us to know you. You're such a great and awesome God. And Father, may every day of our life we, we learn better and better how to walk with you, how to follow Christ in all that we do. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus, to come and die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sin and to raise him again from the grave. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And now, Father, help us every day to learn how to live better and and to live more according to the principles of your word and take these truths that James has taught us and, and to apply them to our lives as well. Father, I pray for many that are listening right now. Lord, bring them into relationship with you through your son, Jesus. 
May this be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray for many right now that are listening that need to recommit their hearts to Jesus Christ today. I pray you'd move in hearts. And Father, for all of us, may we learn today to live better and more fully in our relationship with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that you'll visit our Next Step Center. Talk to one of our ministers today. Now, I always end the service the same way, and so I'm going to ask you in just a moment to say our purpose statement with me, but then right after the purpose statement, you're going to see a video about what we experienced Friday night. You're going to love it, so stay tuned to that. Would you say it with me? Our purpose is to love and lead all people to life change in Christ. God bless you. Have an awesome week.